Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. We believe that God's Word has the power to change lives. So grab a pen and paper and get ready for this message. So tonight we're going to talk about, um, the, the, the title of tonight's message is Away in a Manger, and we're going to talk about when God is found in isolated places. Anybody who wants to sing a song special? I think Ashley needs to come back up and sing Away in a Manger. I'm just <laughs> Just teasing. Just she says, ah. Um, so I'm going to read from Luke 2, um, but before I do, I want to introduce you to our panelists tonight, some of the girls that are uh, part of the church here, um, just briefly, and they're going to get to share a little bit. But this is to my left is Savannah, and Savannah is, um, she's one of the leaders in our church, and she has 42 children under the age of two. Um, <laughs> And, um, and then this is Elise, and Elise actually is on my staff with me, and she works under the, in the creative department, um, and she is single and ready to mingle. Um, and, then, uh, <laughs> um, and then this is uh, Carrie. Carrie Cutshaw is married to Pastor Travis here, who is our worship pastor and oversees our worship at all of our campuses. And she also, she oversees our Safe Haven Ministry, which is the nonprofit um, that Arise Women's Ministry started. So um, I'm excited for you guys to get to hear from them, and we'll have plenty of time for that. But I want to start with just a very famous passage of Scripture that you've all heard, and um, I know you read every single um, Christmas, or hopefully you do to your kids, but Luke chapter 2, verse 7, and this is talking about Mary, and it says that she wrapped him in cloths, and she placed him, talking about Jesus, in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And so we all know this story, and we think about this song, you know, Away in a Manger. Um, and we think about the fact that Christ, and it seems so almost common to us and commonplace because we've heard it so much, but really the Messiah showing up not in a palace but in a manger somewhere off in an isolated place was a very big deal. And the reason it was such a big deal is because most people didn't go looking for the Messiah out in a barn. Can I get an amen? Like, and so it's really setting a precedent for the way that God really works. And you think about the people who actually um, found the Messiah, that were looking for the Messiah and found them. It was shepherds and it was wise men. They had to follow a star. They had to listen to the voices of angels to guide them there because they had no idea that here, this long-awaited Messiah would be in this lonely, isolated place. So the Messiah was unexpectedly found in this isolated, despised and far off place. And I really believe that this is almost a precedent for how the Lord works in our lives and the lives of his children is that we unexpectedly come to find that sometimes when we're seeking God, we're like the wise men who still seek him. You ever read that? The wise men still seek him. When we sense this prompting, we notice that God is pulling us in a direction um, and we're coming toward God. We're drawing near to him. Sometimes we can unexpectedly realize we look up from pursuing God and realize this is a really lonely place. That this can be actually a very isolated place, and we don't expect God to be in a place that seems so anonymous, that seems so off in the distance, that seems so away. But actually, we want to talk to you tonight about how isolated seasons are actually places, if you feel anonymous, if you feel forgotten, if you feel like you don't have a crew, um, that isolated seasons are actually God-ordained seasons, they can be. And so we're going to talk about that tonight. But how many have ever felt like um, you've experienced what I would call Christian loneliness? Raise your hand in the room. Like you felt like you could be in a, a crowded room full of people, but you felt like you were all alone. And so sometimes this can take us by surprise if we're not expecting this. But I want to talk to you tonight about to these isolated places, and what do you do if you find yourself there, if you feel loneliness, if you feel like you're off in this barren wilderness? What do we do when we're experiencing a season of loneliness and isolation? So we're going to talk about two different type of isolation places, why they occur, um, and what to do when we're in the midst of them. And so I'm going to give you two if you have notes. I want you to take the first one. I'm going to open it up to ask a couple of the girls some questions. But two different types of isolation places. The first one is seasonal and necessary. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's necessary, girl. 
It's necessary. And so what I want you to understand is that to take some of the shock when you find yourself, I know I had a friend that she's been saved about three years, and she and I got on this discussion before she actually knew I was talking about, uh, I was going to, I was planning to share this, and she's actually coined that phrase, Christian lonely. She said she actually Googled, is Christian loneliness a thing? That she was shocked to find herself in this place where she felt alone, even though she was surrounded by the body of Christ, and even though she felt closer to God than she ever had, she still found herself lonely. And so what I'll explain to her and what I would hope that you would understand by the end of this message, this is not a bad thing, nor is this an abnormal thing. This is a necessary season. How many of you love winter? Okay, like three people. Okay. So listen, winter is not, ab- we don't freak out when we walk outside and we see snow every day. We're not freaking out when the leaves fall off the trees. We know this is a regular, normal part of seasons. And there is a regular, normal season of feeling like you're alone. And we're going to talk about why this season is so necessary. But I want to bring up a couple of things that would cause you to go into a seasonal um, uh, isolation period. So like one would be if you move from out of state, okay, it's like, you're moving away somewhere you don't know anywhere. I really experienced a uh, deep season of isolation when we first moved here a thousand miles away. Also, grief can cause a season of isolation where you pull back from, you actually are pulling back from people because you feel isolated, like people don't understand what you're going through because you're grieving in a very deep way. Um, Babies can cause a season of isolation. Can I get an amen? Like, because you're in diaper land and you don't ever talk to an adult, okay? So, like, you can be, even even seasons like divorce, the end of a marriage, can cause certain friends friendships to be cut off or to change, or when your friends get married and you don't and you're still single. All of these things can instigate an isolation season, but I want to give you some good news. It's very normal, and so let's talk about this a little bit. Savannah, why don't you tell them um, a little bit about what you posted on Facebook, which was the reason why I asked her to be a part of this panel. Um, She shared something after our women's conference this year for Arise. Why don't you share a little bit about that? Uh, Yeah, so um, I've been an active member of this church for quite a while. Um, I've always been involved in a RISE conference and really just anything we had going on here at the church. Um, I love to be active. I love to be involved. Um, I really have a heart for um, just seeing his kingdom grow. And, um, you know, this past year I had a baby, which is woo, super exciting. 43. Yeah, number 43. Um, in real life, number four. Um, <laughs> and so that's still a lot of kids. Like, it's a lot of kids. Um, and so I had a baby in May and, you know, really just kind of had to step back and refocus and figure out where my priorities lied. And so unfortunately, you know, there were some things that I had to walk away from. And so leading up to a RISE conference this year, if I'm being totally candid, I didn't even want to go. Like, I was like, you know what, honestly, it would just be easier if I just stayed home. I don't have to pack a nursing infant, um, all the way down to Charleston, um, an hour away to go and probably have to walk out um, to take care of my baby. And, um, you know, being, being active in the ministry, I was used to knowing what was going on. Um, you know, the vision for a RISE conference this year and being a part of the setup and, you know, all of that stuff, all the details. But this year I wasn't. I had no idea what was going on. Um, and so that really sent me into a very lonely, isolated place where I was questioning, what did I do wrong? Why was I not asked to do something? Um, maybe I'm just not doing this whole Christian walk thing the way that I like, thought I should. Um, you know, just kind of self-reflecting and, um, you know, thinking that maybe it was me. Uh, maybe I had done something without really recognizing what season of life I was in. And so I think having a baby... Um, you know, it's a big deal. It's important. And the enemy kind of got in my head and made me feel like um, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't the reason. He skewed my reality. I couldn't really see, um, I couldn't see reality. I was kind of um, lost in this, you know, in this place of despair and, you know, poor me. Um, and it was just, it just wasn't true. It was just lies. So, did, so what happened after that? Like, did so, you snap out of it? Because you had, by the time I checked on Facebook. Yeah, well, I had to, <laughs> I had to talk myself down. Um, I had to kind of open my eyes and realize, like, hey, um, you know, God moves at a RISE conference every year. You know, I don't know why you're making this about you. Um, God can do it without you, I'm pretty sure. So, you know, I packed my baby up, and we went, and I made a new friend. And, you know, there was just some beautiful things that I was able to experience, moves of God that I was able to experience because I was willing to embrace that lonely season of not being involved, not being 
part of the, the big picture, I guess you would say. And so um, really what I had to do was just step back and look at it and make sure that I was viewing reality, that I was, review, that I was viewing what was happening through, um, through the lenses of, of truth instead of the lies that the enemy was sowing. So what was happening in behind the scenes, and so I was so excited that she was able to, like, speak truth to herself. And so, it, you know, I always say um, uh, you can't help it if a bird flies over your head, but you can help if it nests there, right? And so these are normal kind of organic th thoughts that go through our head when we feel left out or uninvited that we would say, what's wrong with me? Why didn't I get included? Um, and so instead of, like, sulking in this deep, dark place, Savannah was able to speak truth. Well, maybe it's because I just had a baby. And actually, that was the truth. Savannah's name came up multiple times in um, planning meetings. I, actually, I kept bringing her up, and they kept saying she just had her 43rd baby. Um, so, like, um, we, we did. I'm like, oh, yeah. Like, this is not a, she's, you know, nursing a baby and then carrying another one on her hip and then homeschooling. Like, this is probably not the season to, to get her super involved behind the scenes, scenes that arise. There'll be years for that. This is probably not the year. So that was the truth. Um, but I wanted to give you this very raw, like, recently raw story because I think we, I think there's power in the truth in exposing some of the lies and the way that the enemy works because he works the same way with a lot of us. Like, he really does. But if, um, and I love that she's able to share those things, but also not to get stuck in those those places amen um, so why don't you share what you kind of learned through that yeah so um, you know we talk about seasons of life all the time I feel like that we hear that all the time seasons of life um, and the thing about seasons is that you know they come but they're not permanent they they go you know and and sometimes they come back around and so hopefully we learn our lesson the first time and we're not you know getting into this season of isolation and just hanging out in there and then it comes back around again and we hang out again and just we're miserable. Um, I think I've learned through the process of four babies and walking through these seasons of isolation that if we really lean in, um, if we lean into God and know that he has a purpose in the season, that, um, that he's going to teach us something. And that way when the next season comes, we're prepared for whatever he's bringing. Um, that if this season comes back again, which most likely it will, um, that we're better prepared, we're better equipped to handle it and to lean in and really see what God wants to do. Um, there is a reason for the season. So I think that's so important to, um, you know, to, to kind of draw back from our situation and, and recognize that there's a, there's a reason. Um, Ecclesiastes 3.1 is the scripture that we always reference when we're talking about seasons. Um, and it just says, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And it goes on and says, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep, a time to laugh, um, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Um, so, I mean, there's a time for everything, you know, and, and I think that if we can withdraw and just look at our, look at our situation and know that um, God is for us, that there's, a, there's something beautiful that he's birthing in us, if, he will, if we will allow it, if we will lean in, um, I think it makes the season that much easier to just walk through. Yeah, so I'm um, from Louisiana originally, and so in, Louis in South Louisiana, we only have two seasons. We don't have four seasons like you do here. We have summer and post-summer, okay? So that's it. Um, and so there is something beautiful, even though, uh, like I shared a little bit about this, the, I think the 9 o'clock Sunday, there's something beautiful about the snow to me and about the fall and the four distinct seasons. You appreciate summer more because you're not in a perpetual summer, right? Like you appreciate um, fall because it's so short and it just lasts like a day and a half, you know? Like you, uh, you appreciate the seasons because there is change and there's something beautiful about finding God in this isolated place that um, allows you to appreciate when you do have community and you do um, you do have this sense of, of belonging. Um, you're able to appreciate it because, because you found something in this isolated season. Um, so there being a reason for the season, you know, we were in, um, in youth Sunday night, and Cliff was sharing with the youth, and I thought this was brilliant. And he was talking about Mary, when Mary was, um, you know, getting ready to have the baby, and she's out in this, she's in this manger, she's out in the middle of nowhere, um, and you think about what does it sound like when a woman, especially with her first baby, has a baby with no epidural, okay? 
Like, it's loud, right? Like, I mean, everyone within the close proximity knows this woman is having a baby. And he made such a good point that you flash forward two years, and Herod, this crazy, deranged king, is looking for this little baby boy that was born. He's going around asking questions. If Mary would have had Jesus in an inn, that could have ended Jesus' life. I mean, there was a reason for the isolated season. And so where you're at right now, this isolation, God is doing something in the isolation. He is incubating you. He is protecting you and doing something in you. You cannot fight this season. You have to understand it's a necessary part of your Christian development. So Elise, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you are and kind of what you're learning in your, in, in your season or where you've come out of? Yeah, sure. So um, I think isolation is such an opportunity for um, God to invite us into something, and an invitation in, requires a response. Um, and so we have an opportunity to activate something in that. And like Pastor Melody said, I'm 25, almost 25, and I'm single. And so sometimes this season, for a lot of girls my age, it can feel like a very prolonged season. Um, and that's not the only thing. I think sometimes I've, I've felt it for sure in, you know, finding a career, finding my purpose and calling and wondering, God, where are you in all of this? Um, and I think this season, uh, God has used it to really prepare me for a lot of the things that he's called me to. And um, I'm a leisure runner. I'm not really like a training runner. But um, a few weeks ago, I ran a 5K. And um, I decided when I got up there that I was just going to give it the best I had. I knew I wasn't going to be able to, you know, win the race. There was no way um, because I hadn't been training for it. But I was going to give it what I had. And so... Um, you know, I'm out there running, and there's like 25 people in front of me, and this one kid passes me up, and he's flying. I think he ended up finishing in like 16 minutes, which is, which is amazing. So, um, you know, I, I'm almost to the finish line, and I feel like God just dropped this like word in my heart that um, we finish the race um, at the pace we train. And so that kind of was just a, a thought for me that's really stuck that what we're doing in our private time when we're not being cheered on and applauded is how we will finish our race. Um, we all have a race to run, which is our life. Um, and God uses the times that we're hidden away, the times when there's no audience, there's, there's no applause um, to prepare us for what he's calling us into. Um, and so when we're out there running, you know, we can, you know, God can use what we've done in, in private. And so that's just been really um, something that's kind of stuck with me, um, just that word, um, for the past few weeks. Um, and I also just want to speak on singleness being just a, really a gift. I think sometimes we look at um, these hidden places as a negative thing, and it's really not a negative thing. There's no season that's really better or worse than God's using all of it. And so I think, um, I think we just need to change our perspective on how we view things. And so um, singleness can really be a gift um, as much as marriage can be. And so you have an opportunity with your time to invest in friendships, invest in relationships, invest in the church, ministry. To sleep um, in. To sleep in. <laughs> Um, so there's just so many, there's so many opportunities that um, that provides you with. Um, and so I think it's uh, learning how to um, see the good in what you are learning, what season you are in, um, and, and just pursuing it with all you have. I love that imagery when she says that isolation is an invitation. Like a nice, it's, it's an invitation, God saying, hey, I want to show you something that I'm not showing everybody else while I'm not showing everyone else. And so um, that's so beautiful to me. And what it really reminds me of, you need to think about Mary again, swinging back to this Christmas story that she's incubating something supernatural. Okay, you tracking with me. Like she's incubating the Messiah, the Son of God. She is growing something supernatural within her. Now, when a baby is being formed and fashioned by the father in its mother's womb, we don't get access to that, do we? Like, we don't get to see what's going on in there, maybe little scopes a little bit through modern technology, but really, we don't get access to that place because something supernatural is happening. And listen, without that incubation, there is nothing supernatural being birthed. And so every single time God is trying to do something through you or birth something out of you, 
you're going to have to have a season of isolation because it's going to have to be individual between you and God. There are no surrogate pregnancies in the kingdom of God. I can't carry you through your season of isolation. Why? Because your relationship with Jesus is personal. Yes, we iron sharpens iron. We grow together. But really, you and I, this is an individual relationship I have with Jesus. And he wants me to know him personally away from the crowd and to teach me something away from all of you and intimacy that I can't get when I'm surrounded by amidst of a bunch of people. So this is really an invitation when God calls us away to experience something, to learn something, and to really find out sometimes when there's yucky stuff inside of us. Isolation is an invitation for God to purify us, for God to heal us, for God to reveal aspects of himself that we can't find out in the crowd. Are you following me? And so, um, so that's the one normal season. But let's, let's switch gears just a minute and let's talk about um, the second type of um, period of isolation that's not normal, that's not healthy, and this is the self-inflicted and harmful isolation season. This is self-inflicted and harmful. So Carrie, why don't you talk a little bit, I know that you and I have spent a good deal of time talking about um, the time that you were, got kind of stuck in an isolation season and it turned into something worse. Why don't you explain that? Um, well, I think, you know, I've had several or a couple um, seasons of isolation, um, but there was this one that, my last one, <laughs> that lasted a really long time. And so, as Pastor Melody said at the beginning, you know, sometimes we get kind of cat catapulted into seasons. And so, um, I think also, if you've had a good, fruitful, successful season, and then you go into like a winter season, it makes it a little harder because it's like having that, um, it's like when you have a child that's really good and then you have the holy terror. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like I wouldn't have had the first one, you know, or had this, yeah, had the, anyway, you know what I mean. So <clears throat> I had had this really successful, uh, fruitful season in my late teens and early 20s. Um, the Lord had called me into ministry. I was doing missions work. I had won some competitions that uh, allowed me to travel internationally um, and speak and uh, went straight from college to being a children's pastor at a large church and just had some wonderful experiences. Um, and when I got married, um, I wanted to have a baby, and so I had my first baby and um, wanted, of course, to be a stay-at-home mom. So I brought my little girl home, and I think that God wanted me during this season to realize his love for me like I loved my baby girl. But um, I realized when I went home that no one was applauding me anymore, um, and that there was no audience. And God wanted to show me that he wanted to be my audience. But um, I went into postpartum depression and stayed there for quite a while. Um, and I felt like God was punishing me, like I hadn't done something good enough, that I wasn't a good enough Christian, that, that somehow I had failed him. <clears throat> then um, uh, we went through some just life stuff. Our, our church split a couple times. Um, my parents... Not this one. Not this one. <clears throat> Not this one. Just clarify. Um, my <clears throat> parents divorced in the middle of this after 30 years of marriage. Um, God called us to move away. Um, and we went to a, a new place, and, and that was grief. That caused me to, to grow up really fast. And um, when all of this happened, uh, we ended up at, a, at another church that was struggling financially and closed its doors and ended ugly. And so um, God called us back here to be on staff. And um, when we came back, um, Pastor Melody and I talked, and, you know, we just said, why don't she, you know, suggested, let's just take six months, you know, and just before you jump in, just rest, you know, and I knew because I'd gone on a girls retreat um, that uh, God was calling me to a winter season. He literally told me, show me this picture of this tree. It had one little leaf on it. And he said, you're trying to hold on to the leaf, <laughs> you know, try to hold on to that season, but I'm getting ready to take you into season of isolation. And that winter's not necessarily bad, that if you have a, if you remain soft and not hard, that when the fruitful season comes, then you, you'll be even more fruitful because you've gone through this season. Um, but I came back, and uh, my winter turned into um, a wilderness, honestly. It took me about two years to get back involved with ministry, and I think what had happened was um, all of the, the, the mindsets that I had adopted over this 
the past few years just kind of started rising to the surface. And so you know how like uh, the children of Israel were supposed to make it through in 11 days it, and it took them 40 years. It was kind of like that for me. Like I wanted to uh, figure out a way to get out of the season. So I started doing all the right things and reading all the books and trying to be good enough and trying to you know, compare myself and, and looking at, you know, Pastor Brandon's my first cousin, so seeing he and Pastor Melody and my husband and my brother and his fiance, and they're all in ministry, and I'm sitting out there and, and feeling like I don't have a purpose, like, why am I here? And just to be honest and raw, like, questioning God and questioning um, his call and his purpose on my life, and and then all of these feelings started coming up from the past seasons of church hurt, you know, like all this rejection and all of this um, offense and bitterness. And, um, you know, we all know that in the wilderness, you know, he's trying to work on us and, and purge us. And so I had to really come to, to terms with where I was and allow God to heal me. And it, it wasn't an easy season. Had I participated, I think that it would have went a little bit quicker, but um, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't you appreciate her vulnerability? Amen. Let's, I mean, I think we kind of all have been there. It's like what I'm trying, what we're trying to get you to understand, though. So while this is a normal thing to to go through, you could get stuck there, like because the isolation season is such a vulnerable experience, like the baby and the like. It's such a vulnerable experience. If you're not careful, if you don't speak truth to yourself, if you don't allow God to deal with you. Um, it can turn into an extended, self-inflicted period of isolation. And so one of the major things that comes up in this season of isolation is if you've got an approval addiction. Like if you've got this need to want to be accepted and want to be validated and want to be applauded or want to be noticed, that's going to surface itself in this anonymous, isolated season. Um, and God wants, and it's a good thing that it surfaces as long as you let God deal with it. And so I want to give you just a few things I want you to write down. Um, first of all, an invite won't fix a heart of rejection. Like being invited to that thing, being a part of that group, it's not actually going to fix the underlying cause. If the cause of this feeling that you're feeling is rejection that God is trying to heal, then healing is not going to be found in being invited. The other thing is that rejection breeds more rejection. So let me explain this. It's like this cycle, this crazy cycle that starts with a spirit of rejection when you feel like you're not good enough or that you have to validate or you have to prove yourself. Either you keep yourself in this self-inflicted isolation by this because you hold everybody like this. Well, I'm not going to go. I don't, I don't feel like I, they want me. I'm going to reject them before they can reject me. I'm just going to stay home. I'm going to decline all the invitations. I'm not going to go. And so you push everybody else away. Or some people swing to the other opposite um, end of the pendulum, and they overdo it. They overcompensate. They're trying to prove themselves. They come on too strong. They come on really awkward. Anybody ever admittedly been really awkward because you were trying too hard? Come on. So like... So people are like, what do I do with this girl? You know, like, um, and so it actually causes people to step back because they can tell that you're trying, you're over trying or you're over proving yourself. Or some people overdo it with a, with a spirit of rejection because they come on as jealous or territorial or they'll, you know, you didn't invite me, but you invited them. And you're my, I thought you were my friend and now you're inviting or spending time with her. And so this overbearingness comes on. And so what this does is it sets off a rejection cycle. People don't know how to deal with it because they can't complete you. They can't fix you, and they know they can't, and they feel this inadequacy. And so they step back, and they back up because they don't know how to respond. And so it breeds this continual cycle of rejection. So that's why it has to be dealt with. The other thing that won't fix rejection is time. Time is not going to just, it's not necessarily just going to go away, or you're going to grow out of it. It doesn't work that way. Anybody know um, somebody in their 50s, 60s, don't shout out a name, but that, and you still have to like walk around eggshells, they're like still dealing with insecurity, they're still kind of woe is me, they still push it with the go away, anybody ever been around somebody that's go away, come here? Like people don't know how to respond to that because it's a go away, wait, I want you, wait, no, I don't want you, why do you want me, why are you inviting me, you didn't invite me kind of feeling, you know what I'm talking about, and it's, you feel helpless to minister to someone like that, and so time is not just going to fix that, um, you have to deal with it, it's an individual response to take responsibility to, to let the Lord heal you, and the other thing is that people can't fix a heart of rejection. Like, only God can fix this. 
Um, so being attaching yourself to certain people and expecting them to carry you through this, we have to get our sufficiency out of Christ because we're not just going to outgrow this. Um, I will say that, like, I love that Savannah said that this season can come back just like regular seasons. The season will surface back around um, and that we have to process it in a healthy way each time. We have to learn to deal with it. So I'll be vulnerable and raw. Um, so, you know, I've, I, you know, being a girl, I've gone through these seasons too where you feel rejected, uninvited, not good enough, you know, um, all through high school, you know, I was like had a mullet, not, not through high school, but as a kid I had a mullet. My mom cut my own hair at home. No kidding. I have pictures. It's terrible. I look like Billy Ray Cyrus. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Um, but, and then in, through high school, I wasn't, I mean, I got I just very insecure. I wasn't like, it wasn't really popular. And so I always felt like I couldn't kind of measure up. And so this sort of carried over and I've had seasons where I've had to overcome and to be settled in who I am. Um, and I'm feeling good. And, you know, this is a good season for me right now. And so I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, I was scrolling through Instagram, uh, dangerous, right? And so I'm scrolling through Instagram and I see this post of all of my peers and fellow church planting pastors wise. And there was like 30 of them and they were all at this like retreat in their Christmas pajamas and smiling. And I was like, why didn't I get invited? Like, you know, I'm not kidding it. So listen, so it pops in my head and I'm thinking, like, why didn't I get invited? Like, what's wrong with me? Like, did they not? And so I had to talk myself down. I, you know what I did? I scroll on past it and I say, well, I probably don't invest as much time as they do in those relationships. And do they always have to invite everybody? Can't you have an event sometimes and not invite everybody? It's okay. I'm a big girl. I'm going to keep scrolling. Okay. So, and so what I'm saying is this is not something you just outgrow. We all have to have good practices of speaking truth over our, ourselves and having healthy perspectives and realizing that if I get my, I, my sufficiency is found in Christ alone. Can I get an amen? And that this person can't make me feel in included only Christ can and there's going to be a season of isolation and that's when I have the opportunity to find out that he is enough for me that I don't need everyone else to be complete that doesn't mean I don't need people but I don't need everyone else to be complete so Carrie kind of explain to me where you ended up how you ended up coming out of this funk well uh, a few weeks ago we took a trip to Africa uh, Pastor Brandon at the beginning of the year had had a, a vision to to go and do a leadership of training over there, and he literally saw a vision of Pastor Travis and Pastor Melody leading worship in Africa, and um, so they asked us if we would go with them on this trip, and um, of course, I w was thrilled to go, and I uh, had done some missions work before, and so I knew that I would come back excited and thankful and grateful, but I uh, didn't know really what God was going to do in my heart, but um, <clears throat> I, I those feelings were surfacing as we were heading off because um, I knew that Travis was in the vision, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> and I was not. And so why am I going? Like, that was my thought. Even God didn't yeah. invite me in the yeah. vision. So, <laughs> God. Um, so, <laughs> so my thoughts were, you know, what is my purpose? Like, why am I even going? Like, I'm just extra money right now. Like, so, um, you know, I, I really was battling with what my, my purpose was. And right away, like almost immediately, I mean, as soon as we landed, Pastor Metley's like, let's talk. I'm like, oh boy. Um, but, but God just started to, to show me this, this trip is not going to be about what you do, but, um, about being my child. And so, um, I just kind of leaned into that throughout the week and just said, God, you know, like I just, I want to rest in your love this week. Like, I need rest physically. I just want to be with you. And, oh, man, what I learned. And just soaking it all in all week long. And so we're getting ready to come home um, after um, our trip. And we load um, the uh, plane. I don't know if you guys have a picture of that. Let's see. Here we go. This is, <laughs> those are our earbuds. Um, we were a little delirious at that point. But as you can see, I'm in between Pastor Melody and Pastor Travis for 16 hours. Um, you can take that down. Um, <laughs> uh, but we're sitting there on the runway, and, and the pilot's like, we're going to take off in five minutes. And then five minutes later, we're going to take off in five minutes. And then an hour later, he's like, well, just to let you know, I know you don't quite understand this, but this plane's about 700 tons something like that. We're waiting for a command from Atlanta um, because the air quality has to be such and such so that we basically don't die is kind of what I 
heard him say. And so <laughs> finally we take off. It takes quite a while, like hours, for them to turn off the, the uh, seatbelt sign. Finally they do. About five minutes later, the stewardess gets on and she's like, everyone, please put on your seatbelts immediately. And Pastor Melly was like, I've never heard them say that abruptly before. And I was like, oh my, we are definitely going to die. So um, a few minutes later, the, the pilot gets on and he's like, okay, um, you know, we um, are going to hit experience some turbulence here in the next little bit. And uh, Pastor Melody looks at me and she's like, I love turbulence. <laughs> she's like, I really do. It's like a roller coaster. She's like, it's so great. It's like when I crawl up in my daddy's lap, I just pretend like God's rocking me to sleep like a baby. <laughs> and I was like, are you kidding me? Like literally when she said that, I was imagining us because I'm watching the screen of the Atlantic the whole time, like straight into the Atlantic. It's filling up with water. I'm trying to save as many people as I can before they all go to hell. And my kids, <laughs> and my kids are never going to see me again, right? That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. I love turbulence. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so in the, in the middle of this though, uh, the turbulence starts to pick up and Pastor Melly, and of course, Travis is sleeping. And, um, and so I did something. I was like, you know what? I'm going to try this. I'm going to do some deep breathing, which it works. So I took a few deep breaths, and, and I just began to pray. And I was like, God, like, why do I think that Carrie's big enough to hold this plane up? Like, really, like, why, why am I sitting here worrying about this? Like, you're big enough. Like, your angels are big enough to get me to my destination. Like, I can't, I can't do anything about this. I have no control. Like, all I can do is just free fall. <laughs> like, I just have to trust you right now. And um, so I, I closed my eyes, and I climbed up in Daddy's lap, and I fell asleep. And um, came home the next week or so, and, and God just took me to a passage in Isaiah 32, and uh, he's talking to these women um, who had a lot of Egypt in them and, and uh, a lot of idols. And he says, stand up, you complacent women. Listen to me. Pay attention to what I say, you overconfident daughters. In a little more than a year, you're overconfident. you overconfident ones will shudder and the grapes will fail. The harvest will not come. Shudder, you complacent ones. Tremble, you overconfident confidence ones. He tells them to strip themselves bare. Then later he says, um, until, so they're going to lose everything. This, the city's going to be abandoned. The, uh, the donkeys, the flocks, all of it's going to be gone. And he says, until the spirit from on high is poured out on us, then the desert will become an orchard. The orchard will, will seem like a forest. The justice will inhabit the wilderness. Righteousness will dwell in the orchard. The result of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quiet confidence forever. Then my people will dwell in a peaceful place, in safe and secure dwellings. And then he goes on to say, you will be happy as you sow seed by abundant water, as you let your oxen and your donkeys range freely. You know, and I just realized, like, how complacent. I mean, like, we think that our striving is what's going to help us, you know, like doing and being, and that's what they were doing. They had the lands, they had the field, they were, and he says, strip yourself, like, until you realize that you need me, like, and until you realize that you cannot do this on your own, um, it's, you're going to be barren, but once you do, then you're going to be peaceful, and you're going to be happy, and um, so rest and trust in the God of peace is the key to navigating isolated seasons. Oh, that's so good. And that's so good. I love that rest and trust in what we can't control. That I could worry about the fact that I'm not there with them. I'm not invited. Or I could just say, God, I embrace the season and I want to learn everything that you have for me to learn in this. Um, and I think some of this, I see a lot of striving when we talk about this underlying issue of like rejection. Um, part of what I see that's perpetuating this is people that they know they want to connect. And listen, that's a godly desire that you want to connect with a group. That's, that's a godly desire. But they get this idolization of, of who they're supposed to connect to, and they try to force an, an, um, a door. They try to force relationships with that are not organic, and it breeds rejection. Um, so 
at some point in time, I have to start looking around and saying, who are the people that God has put in my sphere? And are there people that I'm trying to associate myself with or trying to be a part of a group that's not organic for me? Do you hear me? Like that I'm trying to force myself to be friends with this person because I think I should be friends with it. And maybe this person is who God's put in my sphere to invest in my life. And so it's breeding this or that I need, I need to be a part of this ministry. I need to be a part of this or I need to do this or I need to wear this label versus just resting and trusting in where God has me. I'm going to grow and flourish there and just trust God that if he wants me over here, he'll bring me. That I'm not going to have to try to make that happen. And it creates such a peace that I'm not driving this plane. So you know what? The good thing about not driving the plane is that I can go to sleep like and even if there's turbulence I got the best pilot in the world he's going to get me where he wants to take me and I can rest and trust in that so we're going to have to fly through these but I want to give you some practical really quick um, things that you can do if you're in if you're currently in an isolation season um, so Carrie really fast just tell us number one how do I um, how do I navigate through this practically if I'm currently in an isolated season so you want to get your needs met from him first and like she said, we want to strive a lot of times. I know for me it was self-reliance, this idol self-reliance. I can do this. I can plan this. I can control this. And God said, no, like the key to getting out is not trying to get out of the season. The season's necessary. The key is letting go, like so letting him have it. And so stop trying to control your husband. Stop trying to control the things around you and, and looking to them to be your answer. A lot of times I would get emotional and it would be, I'm looking to Travis to answer what only God can, can give me. And so recognizing that, recognizing when you're doing that with your friends and you're kind of coming off weird. And <laughs> in social media, guys, this season, don't one. get on social media. If it's going to mess you up, don't get on social media. I mean, the other day we posted a family picture. We had 400 likes on that picture. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, I've never had that many likes on my picture. I flipped through, Pastor Melody posts hers, oh, 546 wow. likes, <laughs> right? Guys, <laughs> I'm saying this because, like she said, it's always going to surface, but there's always going to be somebody who gets liked more. Lisa Bevere is going to get 24,000 likes, yeah. right? So there's always going to be somebody that you're comparing to, and you're comparing to their highlights, and like... It's not reality, so yeah. stop it. And I think if you're in a funk, like if you're in a self-inflicted isolation season, you just need to cut it off for a while. Like it needs to be a no-touch zone for social media until I'm through this patch. Like and there were seasons, like when we first moved from Louisiana, I could not get on social media because there was a longing that wanted, I had no community here and I was longing for the community there, but I knew God had called me here. And so there's some of you, like you're longing to be connected with certain people and for whatever reason, that's not who God wants you to connect with right now. And so you need to get off of, the, get off of social media altogether and try to get your needs met from Christ. So let's, I'm going to go to number two, um, if you're in this season. So first you need to get your needs met from him, but second, you need to take the responsibility yourself. So I think sometimes we want to blame others when we feel like we're anonymous or that we're left out. Um, but we all bear personal responsibility for our own growth. Um, I love that Mary, you talk about an isolation season when this little virgin girl, probably 14 years old, she's pregnant back then out of wedlock. Okay. That's already, she's pushed aside and isolated, but then home girl says, and it's by the Lord, you know, like I'm still a virgin. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, talk about an isolation season. But did Mary just stay there in her box? No, she went and found her fellow girls in hiding. Like she went and found Elizabeth. And it was hard. She didn't just go to anybody. She found someone else that was going through something similar but was further along than she was, and she linked herself with them. She didn't sit in her little abode and say, well, no one will come visit me. I'm over here bearing the Son of God, and y'all all just forgot me out here. Like, I mean, that wasn't Mary's attitude. Like she took responsibility to invest and to find someone who could encourage her in the middle of this isolation season. Do you hear me? Like we can't just throw it all off and blame everyone else. I want to take personal responsibility that if I'm feeling like I am alone, that I need to reach out to someone who can help me. But I'm not expecting them to fix me, but I'm going to reach out and look for those fellow girls in hiding that I can link alongside with. Amen? Um, and so make sure we're looking in the right places too. You don't want to get linked up with somebody else that's bitter and y'all just sit in the house and complain and eat chocolate, okay? Um, like link up with the right girls. Um, so number three, uh, Elise, why don't you tell us what we can do for in this season? Yeah, show up when you are invited and participate even though it's vulnerable and risky. 
Um, in Luke 14, there's a story about this um, host, and he's hosting this dinner party, and they get the table set, and he tells his servants, he's like, go tell my friends that dinner's set, they're invited to come, and every single one of his friends comes back with an excuse as to why they can't come, and so the servants come back, and they tell um, the host this, and the host is like, well, then invite the people from the, the city, invite the people from the country, compel them to come in. And so he invites the poor, the lame, the people who were maybe not expected to be his friends and to sit at his table. And I think something specifically for our, my generation, um, I don't want to put all the weight on social media, but I think it does uh, definitely uh, control us in a lot of ways and control our feelings in a lot of ways. Um, I think a lot of us can be really focused on social status um, when looking for friends. We look for what they look like, and we look for people who look just like us. Um, and that we expect that those are going to be our friends. Um, but sometimes those are the people who will make the most excuses um, and won't show up when we need them to. And so I think it's important um, that we find friends um, that, are, that are genuine. And so don't put pressure on people who, who maybe aren't, aren't your crew. Look for the people who maybe you may not expect them to be the, the same people. Yeah, and I could just, just speaking really quickly too, and the worship team, you guys can go ahead and come up, but as we're going to probably have to cut some of this. But, um, um, but, you know, just speaking personally, there's a lot of times that we've tried to, we've tried to create opportunities for growth or for connection, and people don't come. Like, I'm just, can I just be real for just a second? Like, people just uh, don't show up. Have you ever thrown a party or try to do something nice for somebody, and then, like, they don't come, or they make an excuse as to why they're not there? Well, Jesus talked about this. He talked about, it, like she was saying, this having this banquet, and he wants to give you a feast, and then we make excuses, and we back out last minute. Listen, there's something beautiful about being vulnerable and just saying yes. Just show. If you're in an isolated season, sometimes the best thing you can do is get out of your own head and just show up. Do you hear me? Like, we can't stay home and sulk and be sad that we're not included when we're making no effort when someone invites us. Amen? And so I know that's just like real sisterhood truth. Um, and so then the fourth one, um, won't you share that quickly, Savannah? Yeah, um, be the one to call or text. Um, does anybody else's kids like teach them big lessons? Um, I know mine do, and my seven-year-old, we teach her the acronym J-O-Y for joy, Jesus, others, yourself. Um, and that's so simple and so practical, but it works every time. Um, you know, like Carrie was talking about, making sure that Jesus is filling that need, um, that you're going to him and you're not looking for other people to fill this, uh, you know, fix your rejection um, or your spirit of rejection, but um, then focusing on others, serving other people. Um, you're more blessed serving others than, than being served, I guess, is the mentality. And so when you're focusing on others, you're reaching out to them, you're seeing, hey, how are you? Um, you know, not out of a selfish way, you know, like, I need you to, to come alongside me, but just in a genuine servant heart, um, how are you checking in? It does something for us, um, and it really, it really brings that joy full circle. Yeah, and so, again, talking about throwing a party here, basically, is like, if you're in an isolation season, thinking about somebody else that might also be in an isolated season instead of just focusing on yourself and throw a party. I'm not just talking about like, literally throwing a party, but Jesus talked about when you throw a party, don't invite those who can pay you back. But you go invite the lame, the crippled, the poor, the broken. That's what he said. And then your father in heaven will see it and he will reward you. And there's this sort of law of reciprocity that basically when I am feeling afflicted, if I will reach out to someone who, not because they're good for my social status or because they can give me something or they can encourage me, but because I want to encourage someone else, then God sees that and he rewards me with peace and he rewards me with joy. And eventually he'll reward me with deep connections with other people. So if you're in isolation season, listen, this is probably one of the most important pieces of advice I could give you stop being selfish and text somebody else like get out of your own head and reach out to somebody else if you're grieving reach out to I'm telling you from experience from grieving deep loss the best thing we can do sometimes when we are hurting is to reach out to someone else who is hurting and to minister in the midst of our need and so then I just want to we have to kind of rush through this but also if you're not in this season so how so let's say hey everything's great I'm going Things are going wonderful. I feel super connected. Can I encourage you that you have a reasonable responsibility to remember the girls around you that are suffering and hurting? So this means you need to be cautious with what you post. If you know your friend is struggling and you're posting every five minutes about your squad and you know, like you're with them and you're like bragging about all the things that you're doing, like I'm not telling you you can't ever post a, a picture with a friend or celebrate a good moment. I'm just asking you to do all things in love. 
and to remember those who are struggling and to invite them to reach out to them to give grace and show compassion when someone is hurting and to be the friend that you wish you would have had do you hear me and so we reach out we have a responsibility to them um, but so this kind of brings me to this place of we're going to talk about sparkle just for a minute um, and have you enjoyed the girls have you, has this been good you guys can go down if you want to go So one of the reasons this topic came up is because, um, just being real, I've felt a, um, why'd you stop playing? Okay. Um, <laughs> I've been feeling like this sort of grief because we have these amazing like events. I mean, we have amazing events, Sparkle Night and these just beautiful events and conference. But then I hear so much of, I'm lonely. I don't know anyone. I'm not connected. I don't feel a part. I don't feel like I have a group. And so I've really been praying, God, what do I, are we missing something? Are we doing something wrong? And if I look at the book of Acts, let's look at Acts 2. Could you pull that up? Acts chapter 2. It's all the way at the end. There you go. It says, they sold their property. This is the New Testament church. They sold their property and possessions, and they shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. It says, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to, to their fellowship those who are being saved. So when I look at Acts 2, to me, this is the epitome of where we want to be, right? Like we want to look like a New Testament church. But if I could be honest, like when we get a call for like counseling or something and people feel lonely and I try to connect them with someone in the church, like they don't want to meet with them, they want to meet with me, which I would have coffee all day long. Okay, like I love it. But it grieved me a little bit that I don't want, if my goal is to become a motivational speaker, we're doing a great job. But that's not my goal. My goal is to shepherd you, to empower you to do the work of the ministry for the glory of Jesus Christ. My goal is to see women saved, healed, and then empowered, to see you connecting with one another, connecting with the community. You think about Jesus. Jesus was the Son of God, and yet he had a multitude, he had the 70, he had a 12, he had a 3, and he had John who leaned his head on him. If Jesus, the Son of God, was limited as to how many he could have in his personal sphere, we're all going to also be limited. And so if we have a structure or a system that's not set up for community, then I'm afraid that it's causing some of you to suffer. And so what I don't want is more big events, big services where you come in here, you get fed and you leave, you're fired up for a day and a half, but then you don't have accountability and you don't have a sisterhood and you don't have deep connections. Are you still following me? So I'm going to take a huge risk and that this could be a train wreck <laughs> but I have to do it because I'm gonna stand before God. And if Sparkle Night gets cut in half, so be it. If half the people don't wanna connect, it makes them feel vulnerable and weird and they don't show up, so be it. But I'm gonna reach out to the ones who do. And so starting in January, first of all, our name is gonna change. I feel like Sparkle's had its season, but I feel like our women's ministry's name is Arise. And that's our conference name and that's our name. So it's an Arise Women's Ministry. But I don't want a, just another big event. This is gonna be called Arise Gatherings. You can go ahead and put them up. We're gonna start in January. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have tables in here and there. We're gonna, we're gonna break bread like they did in the New Testament. We're gonna have dinner with one another. Uh, we're still gonna have a couple of worship songs and we'll speak. But then afterwards for 15 minutes, I'm gonna have a leader at each table that I've trained and that, we, we, um, that can host that table and you're gonna to eat together and then we're gonna discuss. It'll give you a chance when you hear the message to talk to somebody there. You'll have a group of seven that you talk to that you can pray with one another. If you don't like that table, you can migrate. Nobody will get their feelings hurt, right? Like the next week, next time you can try a different one. But what this allows us to do, it allows us to raise up more women. There's a lot of women in this church that can offer you something, that can counsel you, that can, that can help guide you, can help strengthen you and connect you. But this makes sure that no one leaves here anonymous, that everybody has the opportunity to form healthy deep relationships and connections do you hear me okay so I see the need and I am doing everything now listen this costs us a lot more money okay like this is a lot of money this is a lot harder and a lot more time and so I am doing this because I believe in you and I love you and I want to see you truly be saved healed and empowered what this also allows you to do is to get saved 
get healed, and then maybe one day even be empowered to host one of these little tables. Do you hear what I'm talking about? This allows you to do the work of the ministry and to build a sisterhood. And so we're calling these Arise Gatherings because it's not just a one-night thing that you're showing up, leaving, and then, um, and, you know, staying kind of the same. But this is a gathering we assemble together to break bread like the Acts Church and that we decide together we're going to commit to one another to sharpening each other. Amen? So what do you guys think? A little freaked out? Some of you, you like change like me. You're like, I love turbulence, you know? And then the others of you are freaking out right now. And listen, can I just say when we talked about inviting and people that don't show up, just being real out of love again. Like Arise, the conference, all year long, we're investing and praying. We did the hardest fast I think we've ever done in the history of ever. Like for four, like it was this, I'm just on our face seeking God and God showed up in an incredible way. And some of you talked yourselves out of going for, out of insecurity, out of a silly reason. And I know some of you have post Arise regret that you got a taste of a crumb that fell off the table. And you're like, I should have gone and had, and had the feast. And listen, I'm going to tell you not to do that this year that to come, that a banquet has been set for you, and I'm committing to doing the hard thing, even if it means that we don't have all these women show up. Listen, if 30 women show up that want to be discipled, then so be it. But I'll deconstruct the whole system because I want it on a proper foundation. I want this to be done right. I want, I am trying, I hear you that you want connection, and I am trying, I'm doing, I'm taking every step necessary to make sure that you feel loved and not anonymous and that you connect to those who can help you. Amen. So all you do, listen to me, you show up. And some of you, not all you do is show up. Some of you, we need you to serve, okay? <laughs> this is a lot. Um, so some of you, we, we need your help. We need your help with food. Again, this is a big step of faith for us, but I think this is a need in the body of Christ. And I'm, ex I'm personally, I'm excited. I think we're going to explode. I think it's going to absolutely explode. And it gives us a chance to really know, okay, uh, you know, something awesome that's amazing about sitting around a table and talking to somebody about a message is they see a side that wasn't said. They personally talk about something and you ping pong and you get to really deepen your understanding of what God is doing and share that with someone else. You see them at church and at Sparkle and you now know seven people that you didn't know before. This is a beautiful opportunity. And so I'm asking you to show up. Some of you I'm asking you to serve. If Sparkle Night's been your home for a long time, listen, I need you to serve if you can because we're going to need all hands on deck to do this. And then I'm going to invite I ask you to invite somebody that could, that could come with you. Amen. Again, thanks so much for tuning in today. We hope that you've enjoyed this message and that you felt the presence of God right where you are. If you did enjoy it, we'd love to see you live at one of our campuses. Mount Hope meets at 9, 11, and 5, and Summersville meets at 11. We'll see you there.